Welcome to the Korea Society's live webcast. I'm Jayo, Senior Director of Arts and Culture. Many of us are used to, used to seeing certain artifacts, such as Korean shamanic paintings, in a museum or at an art gallery. Perhaps that is the only context you have seen them. But tonight, Dr. Laurel Kendall explores how these magical images are expected to work with the shamans and spirit mediums in contemporary South Korea and compares the use of them with similar practices in Southeast Asia. Dr. Laurel Kendall is curator of Asian ethnographic collection at the American Museum of Natural History and senior research scholar at the Weatherhead East Asian Institute at Columbia University. A scholar of popular religion and its material manifestations in East and Southeast Asia, Dr. Kendall began her long acquaintance with South Korean life as a U.S. Peace Corps volunteer. Her latest book, Mediums and Magical Things, Statues, Paintings, and Masks in Asia Places, will be published by University, University of California Press at the end of this month. Welcome back to the Korea Society, Dr. Kendall. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. A quick reminder to our viewers, you can send your questions via Twitter at Korea Society Art or email artsandculture at koreasociety.org. I'll be back with your questions later. But Dr. Kendall, the screen is now yours. Thank you very much, Jay. And it is a pleasure to be back at the Korea Society. This talk introduces a comparative project, a project that involves images and the work they do in association with mediums and shamans in some different Asian places. Um, it is a book about material stuff and about invisible entities, gods, ghosts, energies that sometimes go to ground in mediums bodies and in statues, paintings and masks. Um, the cover of this book might be surprising. The image you see is not a Korean image at all. It's from Myanmar. It's not spirits. That's odd if you know my work at all. I've worked with Korean shamans called Manshin beginning in the 1970s, and I've written a few books on the subject. The Manshin who are at the center of my work are shamans, uh, not, not just spirit mediums, but shamans, masters of the spirits. Yeah. While a medium could be considered as something like the spirits or the gods puppet, entranced and taken over, Manshin win the goodwill of the gods and pacify the ancestors on behalf of their clients. They mollify troublesome spirits. They cast unclean things and unwelcome forces away. They also uh, do divinations, minor exorcisms and prayers. They are, um, uh, so they are empowered to make the gods and ancestors a moving, speaking presence. The gods in the shaman's pantheon are invisible, but they become a visible presence in two ways, through the mun munchens manifesting them in kut, um, mobile, vocal, and temporary. And in the images that hang above the munchens altar, these are a more consistent presence, but as paintings, they are immobile, and to our ears at least, they are mute. The paintings were a backdrop to my early work with Korean Munchen, um, but I didn't have much occasion to think about them. Uh, they were images that hung above the altar. They were sacred. They were, uh, they were more than ordinary paintings. I did hear a story once, and I've told this story before at the Korea Society, so indulge me if you've already heard it. Um, all right, Yongsu's mother, the shaman I worked with most closely, inherited a bunch of gods from her sister who was retiring as a shaman. Her sister Chatterbox, um, the medium of this transition was the paintings that were the seats of Chatterbox's gods. So Yongsu's mother took them into her narrow little shrine room and she put them underneath her own deities 
and waited to see how things would work out. Well, things didn't work out very well. She became ill, her business was off. She had really disturbing dreams. After one supremely inauspicious dream, she bolted up in the morning and went into the shrine room and lo and behold, the paintings had fallen on the floor. Her sister's painting, her sister's guardian god, her own guardian god, they were stuck together. They had been fighting, she said. Now, did she mean the paintings had been fighting? Did she mean the gods had been fighting? Were the gods fighting through the medium of the paintings? I didn't have a good answer, but the story stuck with me for years. And then my work carried me on, and we're going to shift the scene here to Vietnam. Early in the new millennium, I was working with the Vietnam Museum of Ethnology in Hanoi, and Fuzai, the big spirit medium temple in the north of, of Vietnam, and temple dedicated to the mother goddesses of Vietnam, dedicated statues to the museum, beautiful statues. Now, um, we needed to consult with one of the primary spirit mediums, Madame Zuen, and she was coming to the museum to talk to us. And the conservators noted that the statues had gotten a little dusty in storage. So they brought them out and they set them on a wooden platform and they were industriously cleaning the statues. And Madame Zuen showed up and she was horrified. She said, on the floor, you put the statues on the floor. Would you put Ho Chi Minh's statue on the floor? And this was a moment where this project was born because um, my colleagues, my Vietnamese colleagues, they knew that statues in temples were animated with divine presences, but that these statues were unconsecrated. Even so, there was something special about them and we felt we needed to learn more. Um, and that was the beginning of a, a project. The mother goddess tradition in Vietnam has interested me as it interests anyone who's ever seen a Korean kut. And then you go to Vietnam and it's people in antique Vietnamese court dress as opposed to antique Korean court dress, but the same primary colors. Some of the weapons and props look very similar. The gods appear in a costume sequence. I really wanted to learn a lot more about this tradition. And then um, the Werner Gren Foundation encouraged the Vietnam Museum of Ethnology and the American Museum of Natural History to do a comparative project together. And as part of that project, I worked with Vu Thi Tan Tham and Nguyen Thi Tu Hung on a project about statues. How do you make a statue for a temple? What's special about them? We went back to Phu Zai, to the um, a couple who had donated the statues and they introduced us to the people who had carved them and lacquered them. And uh, we talked to their spirit master. We learned a great deal about what it takes to make a temple statue. Um, it was, um, it was an interesting moment to do this work because Vietnam had gone through a period of high socialism where in some instances, statues were torn down and people told us bad things happened. We went to a village where they had to take the statues down and they were cast in the pond. And then there was a flood and people died. And there was one woman who said, I have horrible arthritis because we had to take our statues down. It was a moment of rebuilding. So there was a lot of work going on in the carver's workshop. And we got to talk to the carvers. The first lesson, of course, was that the statues were seen as agentive that the way you cared for your statue would have some effect on your life. And of course, I was thinking again about the, the paintings that fell to the floor. Um, I learned how these images are regarded as presences, the way Buddha statues throughout the, end of the Buddhist world are regarded as presences. They're consecrated. They're ritually enlivened or animated through appropriate techniques and practices. And so we studied the, the making, the enlivening, the subsequent careers of the statues. 
Um, and to present myself in this milieu, I'm this crazy Western woman and won't I think it's all superstition. So I would start by telling people the story of the paintings in Yongzhu's mother's shrine that fought with each other and fell to the floor. The gods who fought in the paintings fell to the floor. And people would say, ah, oh, yes, <laughs> that sort of thing can happen. And that was a very good opening to talking about spirits and animation and putting souls inside of, of statues and things that go wrong when you don't treat the statues well. Um, and uh, so I used this story of the paintings, the Korean paintings that fell, that fell to the floor um, in my conversations with image makers in Myanmar. And when I talked to mask makers in Bali, everyone understood that this kind of thing could happen with sacred images because the images were in their understanding more than just images, more than just carved wood. The book I would write is a consequence of these conversations with four central cases. It began with the work in Vietnam. And then I spent just a little bit of time in Myanmar where there are likewise carved images in temples frequented by costume spirit mediums. And on the strength of those two projects, I um, went back to Korea. And I'll be telling you about what I was able to learn on the basis of what I had learned in other places. And then Bali, oh, all anthropologists love to go to Bali. Bali was like the cherry on the Sunday. Um, I approach this work through three attributes or affordances that my cases share. They're nested in each other, more and more narrow sharing, like the little nested doll, Russian dolls that fit inside each other. The first one, the biggest doll, is, is how statues, images for sacred use are fabricated. I'm looking at places where religious images have long traditions of workshop production, where they've been commissioned as acts of conspicuous devotion and produced to a high level of skill, where levels of um, material consumption enable standards and hierarchies of value. Some workshops are better than others. And with respect to materials and craft, this affordance spans what we might think of as the Catholic world originating in Europe, but no longer restricted to Europe and the Hindu Buddhist world. Those who commission, install and subsequently venerate sacred images are dependent on the good intentions of a process that has been entrusted to other hands. Um, but, and this is my second affordance, there is a huge significant difference between religious statues in the Catholic world and religious statues in the Hindu Buddhist world. Catholic images are considered sacramentals. They're there to inspire prayer, to enable the reception of grace, but they are not or are not supposed to be idols. And Catholics are very sensitive about this point. When they show signs of life, and you do hear stories of weeping statues and bleeding statues, they are considered miraculous or at least theologically problematic, and there has to be a big investigation. In the Hindu Buddhist world, images are made and inhabited by gods. This is what's supposed to happen. In the slide, you see of the Vietnamese carver on the left prepare a cavity into which special matter, some see it as the equivalent of body organs, um, is inserted by a ritual master sealed and that's what's happening on the right. And then the statue is ritually enlivened, its senses are awakened, its eyes are opened. Um, these images are regarded unabashedly, unapologetically as presences consecrated and venerated through appropriate techniques and practices. What you see here in Vietnam would be legible to statue carvers in Myanmar, to mask carvers in Bali, to carvers of Buddhist temple images in Korea and China. In these places, 
the relative quality of materials, the craftsmanship, and some practices we might cautiously call magic um, are consequential for the image's subsequent career. Is this going to be a good and powerful statue that really transmits, or is this one going to be you know, more moderate, weaker, uh, even a dud? Now, the final affordance of my four case studies is that under the very broad umbrella of sacred images, in a larger Asian world, there are some distinctive traditions of mediumship and shamanship that are aided and abetted by human engagements with the images. A mirroring and manifesting of things otherwise unseen happens with both with respect to the images and to human bodies. The God, spirit, or energy operating through the image also enables the work of the more mobile and articulate human agent, the spirit medium or the shaman. This is the case in Lendong in Vietnam, in Nat Pue in Myanmar, of course, again, in Kut in Korea, performed by Manchin, and in Bali, the mask image covers and subsumes the identity of the medium when the deity appears in temple festivals. In the carving workshops of the Red River Delta, I learned the importance of craft and not just good wood and excellent skill, but attention to some of the things we might call magic. In the most traditional workshops favored by respected temple keepers in, um, in the Red River Delta of Vietnam, the wood is cut on a day and hour set by the lunar almanac after sending away any ghosts or other infelicitous forces that might be in the wood. The person who wields the ax has to have a compatible horoscope. And then, all right, as per wood craft, the wood is properly seasoned. And then when the statue is cut, they use Luban's ruler. This is a, a ruler scheme that was an ancient Chinese practice. Korean furniture is proportioned according to Luban's ruler. Um, but you see this ruler all through the Chinese world, you know, with respect to carving uh, statues, you see it in Vietnam with respect to making ancestor altars and carving statues. You cut to a certain number of inches and you get a statue that's very good for family continuity. You cut another bunch of in inches, it's good, different, it's good for wealth, it's good for talent and so on. Now, you know, is that craft or is that magic or is this a concatenation of the two, which combined with the carver's skill, combined with the offerings, the prayers, the fact that no menstruating woman should touch the statue while it's being carved, the fact that you should only say positive things in the workshop when you're working on these positive statues, you should never hang laundry above the carving, and so on and so on, all work together to make a statue that will hold a god and the god will be happy to reside inside or a buddha um okay so of course not all images are equally efficacious nor are they all made with the same care in vietnam there you know with the booming market with right return of popular religion there are a lot of places that carve statues through rationalized production. You can buy them off the, sh off the shelves of a shop. Those, even the shopkeepers will say, are less efficacious, but you know, you, you, you get what you pay for. Um, there are some where the, you can order through the shopkeeper specific to the deity you want. That's a little more expensive and it's a little better. And the best ones are done like the ones that the opening shot at the Vietnam Museum of Ethnology, where you commission specifically from a traditional carver, and the carver does the traditional rituals and does things according to the almanac and runs a workshop where all these traditional taboos and purifications are observed. And of course, they're the most expensive. Now, the young mediums, they'll say, it doesn't matter. It's the ritual specialist who comes and puts the God into the statue. So, you know, if it's a pretty container, so what? 
the serious old mediums with the serious old temples who can afford the super statues, they'll say, oh, no, 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 that's bad. Yeah, ugly statues bring you bad luck. This is the kind of conversation I heard in Vietnam. I would hear it everywhere else. Um, that's what markets are and market choices are. Um, now, Myanmar is also in the Buddhist world, albeit it's Theravada Buddhism. It's a different calendar, but calendar observed nonetheless. Um, and from what I had read, these images were also um, animated by spirits uh, belonging to spirit mediums. In this instance, spirits called Nut. Uh, they're invested with the nut's butterfly soul and they live in close association with the mediums who bathe them and dress them. Uh, note how they're arranged in the basket. This is my cover image. They are, um, you know, they're not, they've been carried to a festival, but they haven't been stacked in the basket for an economy of space. Rather, they're set up so they can see what's going on. I mean, they're traveling, they ought to get the view. And that's the sense of intimacy and the sense of person is something that, you know, one can think of the way some children feel about dolls that comes across in the intimacy with which some mediums talk about their little nuts. Now in Myanmar, this was a quickie for me. Um, I worked with Aaron Hazanoff, a colleague who spends, has spent a fair amount of time in uh, Myanmar and we, our field assistants, um, Do Te Te Win and Do Ki Pi Tan. Um, so I had, I had been curious about the, the Myanmar Nat Poi, the way I had been curious about the mother goddess ritual because here, as in Korea, again, sequenced costumed gods appearing, albeit appearing in mediums and not shamans, and a close relationship between a mirroring of a deity representing it in an image and a deity represented in a costumed medium. So I wanted to see the workshops that carved the medium small wooden images. Um, I wondered, were they as attentive to magic as their counterparts in Vietnam? Um, now, the mediums carry their images to rituals as co-present enablers. This is um, the, the Korean parallel here is with shamans in the Huanghe tradition who roll up their gods and carry them to rituals. And the consequences are the same. They get battered over time. They, it's, it's kind of a tough life if you're an image. Um, and there is some effort in Myanmar to refurbish, to regild. They can, you know, at the time that I was there, they could afford to do this. But in the things I read, the images were pretty, you expected to see a lot of pretty battered images at a festival. Um, it's, it's a much more portable practice than what we saw in Vietnam. When we spoke to uh, uh, the carver, oops, oops, sorry. When we spoke to the carvers um, near the big pagoda, Mahamuni Pagoda in Mandalay and the Shwedagon Pagoda in Yangon, they were familiar with our questions. Oh, yes, we're very, we observe Buddhist precepts and we fast and we do this and we do that. But it became, and it depends on what people pay, how many Buddhist precepts they will indulge in while they're carving. You know, so much to be celibate, so much to abstain from meat and drink and so on. And, but it became clear that what they were really talking about was the carving of Buddhist statues that they didn't consider, well, they said, if people pay, we'll do anything when we carve, but they really didn't consider the carving of nut statues as consequential as carving Buddhas. And the reason for this, well, the Buddha is the Buddha. And um, the Buddha is uh, usually commissioned by a community. It's a big group effort. The nuts, um, they said, well, they, those statues, you know, they're cheap things for individual clients. They can be cruder. Um, and we don't get to concentrate as much. So we're not as spiritually happy and with it when we carve them. But it's sort of, it has to do with who the nuts are. 
Um, these are relatively lowly beings in the Burmese scheme. These are beings who died, um, you know, died suddenly, sometimes died violently. They didn't get to concentrate on nirvana, so they're stuck here. The way some Korean shaman gods are seen as being stuck here, and they do what they do, and they're active and they're lively because this they're they're tied to the world through appetite and grievance, and but then that can help you because they you know these emotions give them also power. They can help make you rich. They can help you in love. Um, they are, people feel, you know, I can take to the nuts the kinds of issues that I wouldn't bother the Buddha with, because he's, he's on a higher plane thinking of higher, more spiritually important things. And good Buddhists work towards salvation by following the precepts. The nuts um, exemplify um, the appetites and failings of the flesh. Um, and this is demonstrated when they're called up and perform. And I was reminded of some of the deities who appear in Kut and have an appetite for alcohol and an appetite for you know, meat and so on. Um, they, things can be quite rowdy around the nuts. Uh, they have human failings. They have ang their anger is dangerous, but they bestow good fortune on devotees who please them. And uh, so they, they're they're there for people, but you know, but their appetites are unabashed. The images decay more quickly than Buddhist images. Very old images are hard to find, and this is probably has to do with how they're produced. These are not like making a Buddha image. You, they're small. You can use the either the branch wood instead of the core wood. You might not season them as well. Nuts can even be made of plastic, whereas in Myanmar, at least 10 years ago, when I did this work, you, you would be very hard pressed to find a plastic Buddha. Okay, so materiality reflecting different kinds of spiritual presence. That's, that was my big takeaway from Myanmar. And I was ready to oops, go back to Korea and learn more about the images of gods that had been fighting and fell to the floor. I had, I had some ideas, I had some questions, and I was having a good time doing team research. In Korea, I usually work alone or with a field assistant, but this time I joined forces with Dr. Jung Sung Yang, left, um, uh, who is now the director of the Shamanism Museum and Mr. Yil Su Yun, who is the director of the Kaui Museum of, of Folk Art. And they both brought different strengths to the question of shaman paintings, including you know, deep art historical knowledge that I certainly did not have. Um, and then I went back to the Munchin's shrine. And um, you know, but note, we are not talking about carved statue bodies. We are talking about two dimensional paintings and this will be different. Um, paintings on laminated paper, sometimes even we're talking about cheap commercial prints. When Munchen installed Buddhas in their, on their altars, and this is a fairly recent practice, they mimic Buddhist eye-opening rituals. They either call in a monk or they buy a little book from the Buddhist supply shop and they do the ritual themselves. In the Buddhist world, animation in the container of a statue body has a liturgical certainty. You do the, you do the ritual properly, and the God or the Buddha is there. They may not, they may be there more strongly or more weakly, depending both on the ritual and on the quality of the container, but they're there, you get them. When I asked how the gods enter the paintings, I encountered some vagueness. We cause the gods to be there, Amunchen said. And no, there's no special ritual for this. The gods do go into the paintings. The paintings are their seats. The Manchin needs them to be there in order to receive myungi or inspiration in the form of you know, 
bright energy coming to the mansion to enable her work. And this is supposed to happen. They're supposed to go into the painting when the mansion sees them during her initiation ritual. She sees them and they're there and they're present going into her shrine. I thought about it and I realized that Diana Lee and I had actually captured this critical moment <laughs> on the film. This is an initiation foot and the young initiate for the very first time is going to go up on the <laughs> She says it would really have been a disaster if you'd gone all the way up there on the knives and they hadn't shown up. <laughs> so um, this is a, a critical, critical moment. Early in the ritual, she's berated the initiate. She said, they're not going to move your tongue for you. You have to act like the god in order to become the god. And then eventually overwhelmed, the initiate gets into it and she feels that she is empowered to do this. Like, oops, like much in shaman practice, it's all a bit ambiguous. The gods might not arrive at all and the, initiate, the initiation fails and the paintings go back to the shop or a charlatan munchen might pretend that the gods are there. Other shamans say, oh, we can tell. We can tell who's got empty paintings. Um, the gods might arrive, but without sufficient force to truly empower the munchen. And sadly, that was what happened in the kut that you just saw. She, she had it, sort of, but not. she never felt empowered enough to really perform as a shaman. This is an ongoing relationship. It can risk rupture. Um, the gods you know, might just get mad at the shaman and they just send her static. Or the gods really, you know, get really get angry and they leave completely. You know, some pollution, some violation, so horrible that they just stalk out and there's pure, there's just emptiness left behind. Um, so it's there is always a certain sense that it's the munchen working with the painting and the and the ambiguity of presence the munchen trying constantly through her devotions through her acts to cause the gods to be present now where do the paintings come from some munchen and a very few traditionalist painters who remain in south korea very very few consider the careful production of a painting um, you know, in ways that are very similar to what I've been describing for the woodcarvers in other places. They sit with the munch and they try to understand her vision, capture it in their own mind and paint. And while they're painting, they live a very monk-like existence. They don't drink, they don't go out and socialize. Um, there's some assumption that they don't have sex. Um, 
while they're painting and then they produce this very powerful painting, the painter's connection to a deity who and a painting that a munchen can take. There are munchen who say, um, you know, if, if I look at the painting and I don't feel the painters put his whole heart and soul in it, I won't take it because it won't work for me. Um, now, this is very few painters, very few munchen, and when they do have the work of such painters, it's, it's a real mark of status for them, that they're the ones who know what they're doing. But in fact, since the late 20th century, most shaman paintings have been made in commercial workshops. It's rationalized production. There's certainly no taboos. Um, they hear what you see here is on the left, a fairly standard workshop portrait of the spirit warriors of the five directions. And then this very interesting piece in the collection of the Kawi Museum of an unfinished painting and a sense that maybe like a Renaissance atelier, it's the master craftsman who's going to fill in the face um, as they turn them out. And these days, even there's even some nostalgia for these workshops. It's, it's um, Korean Chinese from the Korean autonomous region who come down to the South and they knock off paintings very quickly. Some people suspect that they're painting over color uh, photocopies. Um, and of course, there's all the hand wringing about our ancestors are being painted by non-Koreans and so on. Uh, okay, so it's not a fixed container like the statue. It's more fragile. It's, mu it's a mutable thing. When they become soiled with incense and candle smoke they're, or gnawed on by bugs and mice, and I've seen all of that, um, well, then something has to be done. Gods in the Munchen world prefer pure, clean things. So when the Munchen can afford to replace her dirty mice chewed paintings, she politely asks the gods to vacate the old paintings, dirty and tattered, they come down from the wall and they are burned and nice new ones are put up and the gods are invited back. Um, Painting, they're shed like old skin, in effect, a very different materiality from statue materiality, because a shaman is very different from a spirit medium. She's the one who has to work with the object, and the object is just a, a medium for the charge she's getting from the deities, a strong charge or a weak charge, it depends on her. Um, a munch, paintings from the shrine of a retiring shaman would be buried with the rest of her paraphernalia on the assumption that they would rot in the ground like a human body. We do this for people, so we do this for them too. Um, so this lack of fixity, this absence of liturgical certainty um, this ultimate reliance on the variable powers of a munchen to draw in the god's inspiration and the variable powers of gods. Munchen will brag that their gods are more powerful than another munchen's gods. Um, this is in contrast with the Yongdong and Badong of Vietnam and Myanmar, who for the most, uh, the uh, not Zhou of Myanmar, who for the most part experience trance as more passive vehicles of the divine. And they're trancing for the most part, there are a few master mediums in these places, but most of them they're doing it for their own benefit, for their family's benefit. And they just have to experience, encounter the trance and go into it and come out of it. Shamans have to work. They, and they, it's, it's a much stronger sense of inspiration they're dealing with. Okay, so the Manchin fosters a good relationship through her daily devotions, through her purifications, through you know, giving back to the gods in the form of a nice shrine and good paintings when she can afford it. And she goes to sacred mountains to recharge her spiritual batteries. Now that's an, an analogy the shamans themselves use. Need a little recharge here. Um, I came to see the Bunchen's body, the shrine, 
and the mountain as something like electrical circuitry. The Munchen transmitting back from the mountain to the shrine, the gods seated in the images, providing a steady flow of inspiration in the form of words, bodily sensations, dreams, visions, and probably most often good intuition. The success of a kut is very much a matter of the connection between the Munchen and her gods. If she enjoys their favor, and if her gods themselves are powerful, then they send her good inspiration. Her manifestations are compelling, her clients laugh and weep in the presence of gods and ancestors and receive uncannily accurate or at least uh, experientially resonant divinations. The favor that the Munchen receives is transmitted to the favor the client receives, and the kut is a success. The shaman's own identity and reputation are closely identified with the kut she performs. Now, as an elaboration of this point, let's go to Bali. Um, a brief contrast between the expectations of a divine manifestation by a manchin in Korean kut and the deities who inhabit masks worn by mediums in Balinese temples. Here I had the pleasure of working with Dr. Niwayan Pasak Ardiati, a scholar of religious history and a veteran field worker. Um, in Bali, Local tutelary gods, the Sesuhunan, uh, go to ground in temple masks that have been carefully carved and ritually animated according to exacting protocols that are very familiar from other places. The masks gain renown as powerful Sesuhunan. This is Jiro America, a Sesuhunan who resides in the private temple of the former rulers of the town of Ubud. The mask is famous for propelling Jiro America's medium on long itinerating journeys around Ubud, where Jiro America seeks out practitioners of black magic and neutralizes them. I saw Jiro America in action once. I've seen her, him a lot on YouTube. Um, heard many accounts from many people the medium was in the innermost courtyard on that occasion that, that you see here in the slide, out of view in, in a secluded place, suddenly inspired, in fact, inspired much sooner than people expected, put on the mask and appeared in front of all of us coming down the special ladder from the inner temple down to the middle courtyard, dancing briefly and then bolting out of the temple followed by a crowd of devotees, and then roaming the streets for the next several hours, making a circuit of the town of Ubud and some outlying communities. Some people drawn in and going into trance themselves, all of it captured on people's phones and posted on YouTube. Um, the, so, you know, it was as thrilling as people had told me. I had to wait a couple of years before I had a chance to go back to Bali and actually see Jiro America in action. And then I wanted to interview the medium. Using a field assistant's connections to the palace, we were given a name and we spent the better part of the day going through the, the central South Bali countryside trying to find this very busy spirit medium. And when we finally were able to connect with him. He told us, no, you know, he had a reputation as being a really good spirit medium. So they probably thought he did it, but our, our very well-placed informants were wrong. It was a different medium. Now this, you know, his identity had been totally effaced by the mask, something that would just be impossible to imagine in the world of Korean Munshin and Kut, where it's very clearly, you know, Yongsu's mother's Kut or um, uh, Katori Munshin's Kut or uh, Tweji Oma's Kut. And, and that is what is important, uh, in, what you carry away from it. No, in Bali, it's, it's the mask and the medium is just simply a medium carrying the, carrying the mask. Has to be a good medium 
just like a you know a statue body has to be a good body, but but very very different. Now the aim of this journey has been not been to make a typology, uh, or certainly not to offer a particularly Asian interpretation. Rather, it's to present a wide ranging conversation enabled by some broad general principles about materiality and magic among mediums and shamans carvers and painters in my four examples. As we move through them, things learned in one place could be productively upended as questions posed in another place for which I sometimes received surprising answers, you know, that people didn't care so much about the materiality of a nut statue, or, oh, no, there's no ritual for putting the gods in the shaman paintings, it's the shaman who causes them to be there. Um, the uh, paper images that the Korean shamans uh, have may be counter to the gravitas of a statue container, but this has to do with the more ambiguous presence, the more ambiguous relationship of a shaman and her god, and the importance of the Munchen's own agency in sustaining a flow of inspiration, something I really would not have appreciated to the same degree had I not used what I had learned in Korea to make questions posed in other places that generated new questions and some surprising answers when I carried the conversation back home to Korea. So if you are interested in um, the, both in the Korean material and in the cases in other places, I can recommend the book and here is the discount code. And uh, I'm open to questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kendall. First of all, thank you so much for bringing us to this wonderful places, obviously Korea, but then to Myanmar and Vietnam and Bali. Of course, I think we all have this wanderlust now where we, you know, yeah. none of us have really been to anywhere for, um, you know, more than a year. So thank you so much for this wonderful journey. Um, so we wanted to ask you a quick question, few questions about uh, what you've just talked about and which was really fascinating. I first, of all, first of all, I wanted to ask you about the Koreans, um, the shamanistic paintings or actually the altars and, you know, the costumes, all the mansions wear and, um, all the different things that goes on. And the image, as you showed it to us, the images you get is that it's just so colorful. There are just, and a lot of contrast in colors. Um, it's almost busy. Like there are so many things going on. Um, the image we used for this um, live webcast, you know, there are all these fantastic, um, creatures and um, with all the you know all these different colors and shapes so why are they so colorful and busy do they connote certain type of power or what kind of I guess sort of the iconography of the colors and yeah. sort of the composition Okay, color, there are two ways to answer this and one is what color is the, the symbology of color and secondly, what work does color do? And, you know, to the first, the simple, the basic is that um, the costumes and the paintings, um, this is a color symbology that comes from the five element system, Ohang, you know, where yellow is in the center and red is in the east and white is in the west, etc., etc. And, um, you know, combined, it's very powerful. Now the work that color does, um, specific, I'll say something specific to Korea and then I'll make this a little more general anthropological. Specific to Korea, if you think of what Korea was like before industrial chemical dyes, before say, you know, well into the um, 20th century, people talked about Korea as a decorator earth tone place. You know, there was a lot of deforestation, truly, but the way people dressed, 
You know, the Japanese had this romance of the people who wear white, who make white porcelain. And, um, but there were circumstances and occasions that were colorful, that were charged. Um, in the first instance, the court, you know, red, bright reds and bright, and bright deep blues as, you know, royal colors and then as colors of civil officials and military officials. This is a special place. This is an out of ordinary place. And when um, court events happen, they're color charged. Likewise, military of course, you know, color is you know, ferocious and powerful. Ordinary foot soldiers, however, were wearing padded white. Right. And then there are occasions in people's lives, wedding clothes borrowed from court clothes, similarly colorful, mm -hmm. um, children's first birthday clothes, children's holiday clothes, bright colors, this gathering of the five elements in a way that is seen as powerful and in its power auspicious, highly auspicious. Now the shaman shrine, likewise, it's this mustering of powerful color in an otherwise fairly monochrome place that gives you a sense of phrase that Michael Taussig gives us in his book called What Color is the Sacred? Where he says, you know, this, these concatenations of color create a sense of something at odds with the normal. You know, true of shaman shrines, true of important life transformation ritual of the wedding, true of the court, um, true of a child's first birthday, if you want to go there. Um, and so it does, it, what the color says is this is powerful. This is maybe a little spooky. This is out of the normal. And I think that is how the color works, why the color works, why the color satisfies, why it, this is the signature of shaman shrines. Now you get to a more Calvinist perception of the world, a more Protestant perception of the world. Missionaries who went to places like India or like Korea uh, or like China and they go into the heathen temples and they're really just, they have a visceral reaction to the color. This is noted again and again and again. If you read mis missionary writing about Korea and they set out to reform the wedding, isn't it so nice to put the bride in white? Well, she looks like she's in mourning if she's in white. <laughs> but they, you know, they, they made this point again and again. Um, color is an emotional thing. Love it, hate it, indulge in it, but it's not, it's not neutral. And speaking of, you know, sort of the personal taste, um, a lot of, I don't think we talked, I don't think you talked too much about it during your talk, but a lot of these images that we encounter in the United States, they are in the either private collections or private collections that were donated, such as the shamanistic paintings that the Korea Society has. Um, so what do you think, what is the appeals of those paintings to the Western sort of the collector's eyes, I guess. And is that the same, say for the uh, Koreans or Asians who may not believe in the power? Would Asians collect these images as a Western um, person would? Okay, that's a very interesting question. And um, my colleagues and I got into it in this book, um, we, we talked a bit about collector perceptions. Of course, both my co-authors were significant, serious collectors. And we, we talked about, you know, responses, both positive and negative. Um, I think it's fair to say that the first collectors of shaman paintings were expats in Korea. They were the only ones who would touch them. Um, because they were considered, you know, they, well, first of all, very crude. There are, there are people, art, many, I, one of my art historian friends has really horrible paintings. Um, you have to have a love of the cartoon, uh, you know, a love of the naive expression. Or, but, but foreigners saw them as a kind of Korean folk art, and they collected them as such. And then there is a history of collecting where Korean collectors were saying, hey, we can't let the foreigners take this away. Maybe this is good stuff. 
And um, there were two things that I think the Korean collectors saw in them. On the one hand, they, with the Westerners, saw this as a kind of, you know, Picasso-esque naive rendering and therefore artistic. Uh, um, in the book, we quote one of the collectors who said, well, Picasso didn't know our things, but he learned from our ancestors. Yeah, it, it couldn't happen, but it but visually it did. And um, so there's that, that the love of the naive. And for Korean collectors, there is a, these are the faces of our ancestors. These are the faces that are not, uh, you know, what you see in the mortuary portraits of the super young bun official. These are the faces of people who, who live the rough and tumble country life, uh, the hard hardship that, you know, the remembered past. And I think that's part of the romance of the painting. Now that said, there are many Koreans who love the paintings, but are a little bit queasy about putting them in their own home. There are people who've collected them, but store them off site. And there is still some feeling, some emotional sense about the painting. There's also, I mean, I'm very struck by the eyes in these paintings. Korea has always struck me as a place where people don't eyeball eye to eye the way Americans do. But the paintings, boing, and the shaman, when she's an angry god, boing, her eyes are right there. And that's, that's part of the power of the painting, a very powerful characteristic of the painting. Yeah, it was interesting to see that one piece where the eyes, the face has not been rendered yet. Um, so, and the other sort of connecting to that, it was really interesting to see how Buddhism seems to mix with sort of the, the shamanistic rituals in um, Vietnam and all that. And as many of us know, Korea is rapidly modernizing. And also there are so many influences of other religions, Buddhism being one of that. And Christianity is a huge you know, religion right now. Um, at the same time, shamanism still exists. And it's kind of a, you know, a, it's a religion or it's a belief system that still coexists with everything else. And it's been evolving. So I guess um, so, sort of the first question is, what is the connection with shamanism, the Korean shamanism with other religions um, mm -hmm. sort of, and how it has evolved. And sort of the last question of sort of, um, what do you think is the place of shamanism right now in Korea, in the modern society that is Korea? Okay, okay. how has it evolved? And what is its place now? I'll do the right. first one. Um, how has it evolved? Um, if you look at my writing, I avoid the word shamanism because I, I see it as um, something much more organic, much more connected to the surround. You know, it you can't put Confucianism, Buddhism, uh, shamanism in boxes the way histories of Korean religion tend to do. I mean, when the gods come, they they're participating in a kind of Confucian morality when they talk about the afterlife and souls and why you're here instead of there in a better place. It's very much within a Buddhist logic. They borrow certain iconography, certain terminologies, um, certain ritual practices from Buddhism. It's um, uh, Piers Patepsky, a British anthropologist, who's written a very useful little book called Shamanism. And he characterizes shaman, those people we call shamans in other places as being chameleon-like. You know, these are the people who take from out there and bring it into the here and now, so it can always be evolving and always be absorbing. Now, that notion is somewhat upsetting to cultural nationalists who want to say, this is this ancient faith that's carried down to the present and the women who bear it are just, you know, like vessels for this thing that's come down from the ancient past. As an anthropologist, I find that somewhat untenable, but I find that belief itself interesting to study as a Korean phenomenon. Now, its place. 
its place is, I think, twofold. On the one hand, um, whereas in the 60s and 70s, there was this very complex game going on where on the one hand, the government said, this is superstition and we've got to convince people not to follow it and we should tear down the shrines. And on the other hand, you had a tr uh, the scholars of folklore who had been around for two generations or so making the argument, no, this is our culture, we've got to hold on to it, it's important. And at the end of the day, they seem to have won insofar as it's recognized as national culture. There are shamans who are regarded as national heritage bearers, some of them as world heritage bearers, thanks to UNESCO. So it's, it's something that Koreans recognize as a Korean thing. In practical terms, using it um, a little more complex, um, it seems to be alive and well, but not, not in the everyday. It's been moved out of spaces, villages, low-rise neighborhoods. Um, in apartment life, it's noisy. There are noise ordinances. One does, you know, they've been pushed to the mountains where there are commercial shrines. That means that if you are growing up Korean, you might have seen it on television, you might have seen a cultural performance, but you wouldn't have seen it in your neighborhood day to day as something that's related to people's real lived lives. And if you find yourself in a situation where you're actually sponsoring a ritual, it may be the first time you've ever seen a shaman and you're not with a crowd of old ladies telling you this is a good one and this one doesn't know what she's doing. And I, I feel sad about that, but I'm old enough that I'm allowed to be nostalgic. But every, when I started, people were telling me all the good old shamans are gone and the ones you're seeing are second rate and life goes on, things adjust. Um, it's different, but it's different because it's alive. And on that note, um, that's all we have for now, but thanks again to Dr. Kendall for your fascinating talk. We wish you all the best and stay healthy. And we would love to have you come back and hear more about this fascinating story. Um, special thanks to Peter, our IT director for making this live webcast a possibility and our intern Gia for getting all the questions and doing social media postings. And of course, our thanks to you, our members and viewers. We hope you will join us again. Check out what's coming up on our website, koreasociety.org, or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you and good night.